So the opinions expressed in the following webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policies or views of the Editors Association of Canada or its members. Editors Canada is on and is grateful to work on treaty lands and territory of the Indigenous peoples, Inuit, First Nations and Métis of what we now call Canada. We are all treaty people and accept our responsibility to honor all our relations. We encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous cultures, Indigenous territories and effects of colonialization in your region. As one example, as a settler descendant, I am increasing my knowledge by having taken the University of Alberta Free Indigenous Canada course. I would like to introduce Robin So and Roma. Uh, I'm gonna ask, ask you for the correct pronunciation, Roma. You had it right the first time, I was impressed, Ilnitsky. Excellent, Ilnitsky, thank you. Wanted to make sure I was correct. Um, so um, I want to introduce uh, Robin and Roma as our presenters today. Roma is a certified professional editor. She works at Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada and teaches introductory editing courses at UBC Extended Learning. Robin is certified by Editors Canada as a structural editor and stylistic editor. Robin runs So Professional Editorial Services. Today, Robin and Roma are presenting how to prepare for the 2024 copy and stylistic editing certification exams. Please go ahead. Robin and Roma. Thanks, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining Roma and me. Before we talk about certification exams, I'd like to offer my own land acknowledgement. I am thankful to live and work on the traditional and unceded lands of the Halkamalem speaking peoples. The word unceded means that the land was never meant to be given up permanently to governments. Stala is the Halkamalem word that was used for the Fraser River. My home is located where the Stala and Brunette rivers meet. For 350 generations, this area was the ancestral home of several nations, including the Kwantlen, and it was the location of Kakite, a seasonal fishing village, hunting base, and site for cranberry picking. In the mid 1850s, the Kakite and other nations were forced off this land and onto reserves, where most members died from smallpox by the turn of the 20th century. The reserves were then sold without permission, and today the Kakite is the only registered First Nation in Canada without a land base. My current commitment to truth and reconciliation is to hire an elder or other knowledge keeper to share Indigenous approaches to land stewardship with my Girl Guide unit. My commitment to self-education has started with reading A Knock on the Door, a history of residential schools in Canada that was published in collaboration with the Truth and Reconciliation National Research Centre. Thanks, Robin. That was super insightful and a great recommendation for a read. Um, I live and work on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I think it's very important for us as editors and communications professionals to contribute our skills and expertise to reconciliation efforts. I've also committed to doing so in my teaching practice. I'm learning about the first people's principles of learning, and I'm trying to embed those into my teaching. For example, one of the principles is that learning involves patience and time. So I'm inviting all of us to reflect on that and keep that in mind as we learn together over the next hour and a half. Taking a look at what we'll cover today, we'll look at general information about the exams, so the basics of certification, why certify, tips on preparing, we have lots of great tips for you. And we'll also take a little bit of a deeper look at part A, the fundamentals. Robin's going to then take a look at the copy editing exam specifically. She'll discuss some resources for you new standards to be aware of, and an example of how to apply a standard. And then I will do the same for the stylistic editing exam. So some resources, new standards, and an example of how to apply a standard. You should have received a handout today 
which is a list of resources that Robin and I will be mentioning today in the webinar. It's split between the two exams, copy editing and stylistic editing, but you'll see a lot of crossover just because many of the resources are relevant to many of the different levels of editing. So you'll notice that there's a general reading list and then there's also example reading lists sort of um, that uh, go a little bit more specifically into which sections of those resources might be particularly helpful as you study. And we've drawn on our own experiences of studying for the exams to highlight those specific sections. Before we dive in, I just do want to state that a disclaimer that this is an informational session. We're not going to be teaching you any editing skills and we can't guarantee your success on the exams if you do choose to write them. Okay, let's dive into some general information. Some of you might you know, be quite familiar with this, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what we're talking about. So there are four exams in total that you can take from Editors Canada, and those are each focused on one of the levels of editing. So structural, stylistic, copy editing, and proofreading. They're offered alternating years, two at a time. So this year in November, they'll be offering copy editing and stylistic editing. Then next year will be proofreading and structural editing. The goal of the exams is to test mastery, not just basics. So there is a requirement for you to have quite a bit of experience and knowledge before you take the exams. The recommendation is for people to have at least five years of editing experience. That's just a, you know, a guideline. There is no rule. You don't have to apply or prove that you have the five years of experience, but it's just a way of um, really driving home the point that you need to have quite a bit of experience. And it's also not just experience in that particular skill that you're being tested on, but a wide breadth of experience because you will also be tested on you know, uh, fundamentals of editing, which involves you know, all the different types of editorial processes I'm going to talk about in a few slides from now. If you're a newer editor or you're not sure whether you're ready to take these exams, there is a great new alternative from Editors Canada called Editing Essentials. It's a one hour multiple choice exam with 45 questions and it tests the basic basics of editing, the basic understanding of editorial skills. And it's a really great way for you to show clients or potential employers that you have a basic level of editorial skills. So that's something for you to look at if you're not quite sure if you're ready to take the certification exams. So how do you know if you're ready? There is a checklist from Editors Canada that we've linked on the resources list, and it has a series of questions that help guide you to understanding and deciding whether you're ready or not. For example, one of the questions is, is my experience reasonably broad? So that means, have you only worked on a specific, a certain type of document or only one type of editing? in one specific field. If you have, um, then that's a cue for you to maybe do some more reading and some more practice in different areas to get that broader experience. Remember, it's not just about how much experience you've had or how long you've been editing for, but also the breadth of that experience. How widely have you edited? Another question on the checklist is, have I read books that may help me pass the exam? And again, if the answer to that question is no, then you can create a reading plan to help you achieve yes on that question. So if you're not sure, I do urge you to check out that list and just to you know be really honest with yourself and um, try to evaluate whether you're ready 
or not. And now I'll hand it over to Robin to talk about why. Thanks, Roma. Um, I've written two of the exams and preparing for them allowed me to identify my strengths and weaknesses <clears throat> and to improve my knowledge and skills in genres of editing that I rarely work with, as Roma said. Um, <clears throat> and by reading a wide range of materials, attending relevant courses and webinars and working through Editors Canada's study materials, I knew that this professional development had made me a more effective editor, regardless of what the outcome of the exam might be. I sometimes struggle with imposter syndrome. It used to determine whether I said yes or no to particular projects, but passing that first exam truly changed how I perceived myself. Before that, I didn't believe other people's assurances that I was good at my job, but passing the exam was objective proof that I deserved to call myself an editor. And as I've already said, the months of study and preparation in and of itself gave me the confidence to know that I was a professional. I think the most important thing I want to convey with this webinar is to not let self-doubts about your readiness or anxiety about taking exams to prevent you from trying. If you're at all tempted to write, write the exams. If you believe that you've got the requisite experience and you're curious about how you do, I encourage you to go for it. Yes, it is expensive, but think of it as an investment in you and your business that will pay for itself within a few years. So I think you can tell that I'm trying to say being certified gave me so, so much confidence that I'm offering something of value. When I pay my massage therapist $100 for a session, I gulp at the amount inside, but I don't question their expertise or the value of their service. The day I realized I should be applying that same reasoning to myself was actually a revelation. A massage therapist has years of training and experience. Well, so do I. Now, on my invoices to clients, I make a point of including all the applicable professional standards that I applied to their projects to demonstrate my editorial excellence as I worked through their material. So and it, that has given me the confidence to, as I said, to raise my rates um, each year. Okay, let's talk about some tips for preparing. The exam is four and a half months away. Starting now will give you time to prepare in small incremental steps. It's one of the strategies I used to avoid feeling stressed or panicked as my exams, exam dates loomed. With four or five months, you can prepare thoroughly and not feel rushed or overwhelmed. The date of the exam is November 16th. Work backward and slot in the date you plan to write the practice exam. The dates by which you will complete each exercise in meeting professional editorial standards, which is an Editors Canada resource that Roma will talk about shortly, and fill in the rest of your timeline with the other material you're going to work on. Making this schedule and sticking to it will help avoid feeling overwhelmed, and the schedule will also keep you accountable. There are two parts to the exam. Part A tests your knowledge and understanding of the fundamentals of editing. Those fundamentals are covered by part A of the professional editorial standards. Part B of the exam tests your mastery of part C of the standards if you're writing the stylistic exam or part D of the standards if you're writing the copy editing exam. Do study the standards in depth. This will help to identify the specific ones you're unfamiliar with or confused about so that you can understand them more effectively and practice recognizing when they are needed and how to apply them. And do also become familiar with the standards you're not being tested on so that you understand the types of editing you are not expected to do and should not do on the exam as you may lose marks. The professional editor editorial standards apply to a wide variety of materials. So determine the types of documents that you're less familiar with in your own editing work and spend the next few months improving your knowledge and skills in those areas. For example, I rarely work with website content. So when I was preparing to write the exams, I researched guidelines for editing online documents and I practiced applying the standards to them. There is a, sort of, there is a uh, practice test, and one strategy is to write the practice exam at the outset of your preparation to help you identify your strengths and weaknesses and where to focus your study efforts. 
Alternatively, you could write the practice exam a few weeks before exam day, and then, depending on how you do according to the marking sheets, there's still time to work on recognizing and applying the standards you may have missed. Regardless of when you write the practice exam, try to create the conditions you'll have on exam day. Write the practice exam in the same room using the same computer and chair you'll use for the actual test. If you plan to write the exam in your home, ensure you'll have no interruptions. Go to the bathroom before you start. Have the editing re resources you've chosen ready to go on your desk and also have nearby water, snacks, and whatever else you anticipate needing. Aim to write the test in a three hour sitting, stopping at the three hour mark, even if you haven't finished, in which case you'll want to work on increasing your editing speed. So, Besides deepening your understanding of the standards and how to apply them in your work, you'll want to use the next four months to improve your efficiency at covering the various editorial tasks so that you can finish the exam in three hours. So make sure to time yourself as you work through the exercises in meeting professional editorial standards and any other study material you use with the goal of getting faster. The exam scenario may ask you to write a style sheet or to write a memo or query, for example, to a client or manager or supervising editor. Style sheets and editorial letters should be well organized and clear. So if you don't get much opportunity to create them in your own work, I'd recommend taking a course or study, or study material on creating style sheets and on how to write tactful and effective query letters. On the handout, I've pointed you to a few resources that cover these specific areas. My penultimate tip is to prepare for the exam with another editor. It really helps to keep you accountable and gives you another experienced person with whom to share knowledge, skills, and insights. You could start by letting your Editors, editors Canada branch or local twig know that you'd like to find other editors to study with, or reach out on social media sites like editing groups on, on Facebook. Last, there's a lot of information about the exams on the Editors Canada website as Roma mentioned. There is an interactive video which answers basic questions about the exams and the study material available through Editors Canada. The website also offers a detailed FAQ section as well as a comprehensive list of study resources. I've included a link to that list on the handout. So these are the preparation strategies that have worked for me in the past. Roma will, not, will now talk about Editors Canada's study resources in particular about meeting professional editorial standards and the test preparation guide. Yes, so your first step for sure is to get the study resources you need. There's two that are really crucial and people often, it's very easy to get confused between the two, so I want to make it clear. The first one is called Meeting Professional Editorial Standards, and that's a series. Uh, there's one for each. You can buy them as a whole with all four in a single document, or you can buy just the one that you're studying for. And what those are is usually there is eight to 10 exercises in each one. And each exercise focuses on a specific editorial skill for that level of editing. For example, it might for a um, stylistic edit, there might be, uh, you know, change this or edit this highly technical document for uh, to make it more accessible to a broader audience, for example. And these are really great resources because they are put out by Editors Canada and they use the same style and tone that the exams use. And I really like that each one focuses on a specific skill to help you build, build up to that. So those are, those are really important to get. And then the second one is the test preparation guide. So this is the actual practice exam. And the practice exam comes with an answer key that is broken down line by line and will also give you the marks breakdown as well. So once you complete 
the practice exam, you can actually mark it yourself. Or maybe if you're in a study group, you can have, you can switch and have somebody mark it for you. And then you can see what grade you would have gotten. And that gives you a sense of how you might do on the actual exam. So those two resources are crucial, crucial to your study. Also really important is to read background materials. So you'll, as I said, you got the handout, there's a ton of resources there. Um, reading the background materials really gives you a chance to learn a lot more about the skills that you're testing and also to broaden your understanding of things you're not quite sure about. And then do prepare your exam resources by adding tabs or bookmarks for easy reference. So if you're using hard copy Chicago, for example, I found it really helpful to mark it up, put little tabs and then write what they were. And that can save you a lot of time, especially on the copy editing exam where you might be looking up specific sections of the resource while you're doing the exam so you don't want to be you know looking in the index you know you want to have that information easy at hand so going back a little bit to the what I call the MPES the meeting professional editorial standards so this is the resource that has the exercises in it the way that I used them was when I was studying as part of a study group we would meet every two weeks, starting in June, we would usually start in June, and we would do the exercise on our own. And then when we came together in the study group, we would go through the answer key together and we would discuss anything that we weren't sure about. And it was really helpful to have other people to discuss it because the other people all had different expertise and worked in different types of editing jobs. And so they were able to, you know, if there was something about a magazine layout, for instance, one of the people in the study group had done tons of work on magazines. And so she was able to fill in those gaps in our knowledge. So what I recommend is making sure you read the scenario very, very carefully because there are often clues about what you should be focusing on. And this is true of the exam as well. So this is one of the ways that meeting professional editorial standards can really help train you to write the exam well. For example, the scenario might say something like, the junior writer has compiled information from several different sources. Okay, that should give you a little alarm bell. Okay, several different sources. Okay, so that might mean that I'm working with several different voices and styles and registers. Do I need to work on smoothing those out into a coherent style? Something to think about. Or the scenario might say, the author is a little bit eccentric and doesn't really care about conventions. Ooh, okay. Um, if I'm copy editing this, that might be a little bit of a signal to me that I might be getting something with a lot of very unconventional use of grammar and style. What am I going to do with that? So keep your eye, start training your eye to look for those clues in the scenario. Remember also that you are awarded points for identifying the issue and fixing the issue. So it's two parts. So if you identify the issue, you're in a lot of ways, you're kind of halfway there. Great job. And then you go on to fix it or make suggestions on how to fix it. Again, with the MPES, please go through the answer key line by line. There's a lot of very useful information. It can feel very tedious to do that, but it's absolutely crucial for your learning. Make notes on anything you got wrong or anything that you missed. And it's very important here to focus on the why. Why did you miss it? Was it just because you were rushing and you didn't notice it? Okay, then you have to slow down. Or is it because you didn't know that that was a rule or a guideline and that's something that you need to read up on? 
So focusing on the why is really where the learning happens and it's very, very important as part of your study practice. Keeping with that, I always have a lessons learned log. So just a separate piece of paper where I would jot down everything that I came across or that, that was new to me or that I learned during my studying. And I went back to my stylistic editing notes in preparing this, this webinar, and I found a couple of notes there. Resist the urge to copy edit. I had written in, in big letters with a, you know, several more exclamation marks there. And then I had jotted down difference between likely and probably. So I had missed that in one of the exercises. And so that was a reminder to myself to look that up, read up about it, and then remember it as well. So those are ways I think that you can really maximize your use of the Meeting Professional Editorial Standards resource. And now let's move on to some exam taking strategies. Thanks, Roma. Uh, part A is made up of true and false questions, fill in the blanks and multiple choice. Part B gives you a scenario and a passage to edit. The scenario, as Roma mentioned, will contain the instructions on how the piece is to be edited. Because part A is worth one third and part B two thirds of the total mark, allocate your time accordingly. You'll probably want to spend no more than an hour on part A so that you have two hours to work on part B. For one exam I wrote, I worked on part A first and then I moved on to part B. But for the second exam I wrote, I did the opposite and found that for me, that strategy worked because I felt less stressed. I wasn't as anxious about running out of time. So think about different strategies and what might work best for you. So as Roma said, pay attention to the instructions of the scenario. Depending on the scenario and the instructions you've been given, you will need to identify different elements in the document that need to be edited and equally elements that you won't want to touch because they are beyond the scope of copy editing, if that's the exam you're writing. Based on your knowledge of different genres, as well as your understanding of the principles of copy editing, in that case, you'll decide what elements you must make time for and what to ignore. So as you know, different genres have different requirements. For example, a journal article will likely have headings, tables, notes, a reference list. A magazine article may have images and captions. An online government document may have headings, bulleted material, and links. You'll probably want, you'll probably want to approach your edits as a series, your edit as a series of passes, starting with the most important elements, just as you would with a real life project. For example, when I copy edit academic articles, I edit the reference list or bibliography first, and then on the second pass, I work on in-text citations or notes. Similarly, I will save the table of contents for the second pass because the wording or order of some headings may be changed or flagged in the first pass. As you begin to write part B of the exam, create a style sheet, create a style sheet with appropriate categories. That way you can fill these in as you work and add more categories as needed, which will save you time towards the end. Start making notes when you first read the scenario. Perhaps they'll be your initial thoughts about what needs to be done, how you may want to organize your passes, note the standards that you think are applicable. Maybe write yourself a reminder, don't do any stylistic editing similar to what Roma mentioned. And as you work through the scenario, keep jotting down notes, describing the decisions you're making and why. Then when you finished uh, editing the passage and you need to craft your editorial memo, you can work with the notes you've already made. You just need to categorize and reshape them and fill in any gaps. Okay, if you have any questions about what I've talked about so far, there will, there will be a chance at the end of this section to ask them. For now, let's move on to a description about what the day of the exam might look like. Well ahead of exam day, you'll get emails from Editors Canada reminding you that you need an email address from which you can access Google services. You'll be emailed a link to a specific Google Drive folder for each exam you're registered for. About 10 minutes before the start of the exam in your local time zone. And to be clear, all exam times are local to wherever in the world 
the candidate is. You'll receive an email notifying you that the, ten, that the exam file has been dropped into your folder, at which point you'll download it onto your computer and start working on the exam. When you finish, you'll upload the file to your Google Drive folder. You must upload your file as soon as the three hours is up because permission to access the folder is removed within a few minutes, which means you'd no longer be able to upload the file. The exam file is a Word document. It is the only format that the copy editing and stylistic edi editing exams can be done in. As Roma's mentioned, you can have resources with you. The exam is open book, so to speak. You'll be able to use the resources of your choice from a list of permitted ones. They may be hard copy, but you may also access them online. On the day of the exam, the candidates will be given an email address to contact if they have questions or especially if they have logistical problems that are outside their control. The email address will be monitored by a team of exam day volunteers from the Certification Steering Committee who will respond to your emails. The process will be done on anonymously. You will be given a candidate number that you put in the subject line of any email you send to the volunteers during the exam. One final note, there is no proctor. If you need to go to the bathroom, just go. If you need a cup of tea, go make one. No need to tell anyone that you're stepping away from your computer. Having said that, I strongly recommend organizing yourself ahead of time to avoid having to take these kinds of breaks. All right, great tips, Robin. Now switching gears a little bit, we did want to take a bit of a deeper look at part A, the fundamentals of editing, because as some of you may know, Editors Canada recently released brand new standards, well, brand new version of the standards. The previous version of the standards was from 2016, so they needed an update. Now we're on to the, the 2024 version and you will be tested on the 2024 version. So please familiarize yourself with them. <clears throat> Part A is extremely important and I just want you to really understand, do not ignore Part A. OK, it can be really easy to fall into the trap of focusing on the section of copy editing or stylistic editing. And that makes sense. But a whole third of the exam tests part A and it's really, really important. So part A has been reworked quite a bit in the 2024 standards. So just wanted to give you a little sense of what's different. Um, it's there's now. <clears throat> 14 sections. The first one is editorial teams, and that looks at working with other editors, for example, managing disagreements. A2 is editorial intervention and scope. So that's testing how you understand the constraints of time and budget and knowing your own role in the process. Editorial stages. So what are you responsible for in the stage that the project is in? A4 is working with design and production. So you do need to understand the terminology related to these processes. So if you don't work with designers in your everyday job, do some reading about design terminology. Oops. Uh, the next is editorial processes. So that's really looking at workflow. A6 is audience considerations. So focusing on understanding audience needs, including issues like readability. A7 is legal considerations. That's everything to do with copyright, permissions, and citations. Eight is ethical responsibilities. So that includes what you do with misleading, biased, or non-inclusive content, but it also deals with ethical business practices as well. Number nine, and this is a huge focus in all the sections of the professional editorial standards, including A, is conscious language. So we've got tons of resources you'll see on the handout about conscious language. Whoops, sorry about that. 
number 10 is accessibility. This is new and it might be new for many folks out there. Making a document accessible is out of your scope. That's not the editor's responsibility and the standards are very clear on this. However, you do need to understand what accessibility means and what how an editor can contribute to creating an accessible document. You have to know whether there are any laws or requirements related to accessibility that relate to your document. So there's two blog posts I've put on the handout, one by Amy Hagsma, one by Tally Ijack, that are really excellent in um, explaining how editors might understand accessibility issues. Please do read those. A11 is looking, understanding editing resources for spelling, usage, grammar, and fact checking. Now this goes beyond your style guides and your books and also focuses a lot on software. A12 is communication. So all about clear diplomatic queries and memos, as well as knowing when to query and when not to query. A13, which is the, you know, base, one of the basic tenets of editing, do not introduce errors. It's got its whole own section now in the standards. And finally, ongoing professional development. Uh, it's actually in the standards, you are required to expand your knowledge of editing processes, no matter what stage of, the, of your career you're in. So again, please do familiarize yourself with these. Part A, there's going to be questions absolutely on a lot of these issues. Some resources, these are the basics. Chicago has great sections on overall editorial processes. Editing Canadian English uh, from Editors Canada, wonderful resource, as well as its companion, Editorial Niches. And then those two blog posts about accessibility that I mentioned, really a really fundamental reading. So that's the end of our first section, which is looking at the basics. Do we have any questions? Wonderful, yes, we do have some questions. Great. Um, is there any recommendation for the order to take the exam? So for example, should you take the proofreading exam before taking the copy editing exam, et cetera? No, it just depends on where your experience and where your knowledge is. Great, thank you. And I see some people are trying to raise their hands. Please put your questions in the Q&A, type your questions in the Q&A, and then we'll answer them there. Um, is meeting, uh, I think that you mentioned this, the two documents, so it's good to please clarify again, is meeting professional editorial standards the same resource as professional editorial standards 2024? No, that's a great question. Professional Editorial Standards 2024 is a free document. You can download the PDF from the Editors Canada website, and that is just all the standards listed out. Meeting Professional Editorial Standards, you have to purchase from Editors Canada, and that is a series of exercises that test your knowledge of those standards. Thank you. And for meeting professional editorial standards and test prep guides, would you say it's important to have the most recent versions? You talked about the 2024. I may have purchased them in the past, but I think they've been updated since then. Robin, do you know if they've been updated? Uh, the meeting professional editorial standards, uh, we're actually talking about the second edition. Hmm which was uh, published in around 2011, I think. Um, and, and Editors Canada is in the process of updating uh, those resources, but currently that is what is available. Uh, yeah. and, the, and that is the a, a version of meeting editorial standards that we are talking about today. Having said that, um, I actually, was able to get a hold of 
some of the uh, the first edition because it had exercises in it, just more opportunities for me to practice. And I found that helpful. Oh, great. So even if the resources are outdated, they're still, they can still be really useful. Thank you. Um, and then you talked about the format third, two third, et cetera. So please just clarify, is part A one third or one half? Part A is worth one third of the mark. Great, thank you. And part B is worth two thirds, right? Correct. Thank you. Do we receive any feedback after we have taken the exams? No. no. The answer is no. You'll you'll um, receive a letter letting you know whether you passed or failed, but no explanation if you fail where um, where you lost marks. Um, and that's yeah. It's I think that's always been their practice. Thank you. I'm a graduate of the SFU editing program. I wonder how much of my training will be applicable to the exams. A lot, I would say, because I went through the SFU editing program as well. And I mean, that was a while ago, but assuming that it hasn't, you know, the curriculum hasn't, you know, digressed widely, which I don't think it would have, those courses and most of the courses that are out there are actually draw their learning objectives from the standards. So it's good. It's a great basis, a great foundational um, start starting point. Yeah. Do you mind if I add to that, Roma? Of course. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm also a graduate of the SFU editing program editing certificate program. And I also took and passed the Editor's Canada copy editing exam. And uh, like you, so I did the program a number of years ago uh, and I did the exam two years ago. And what I would say is, yes, I agree with Roma that the, the material in the SFU program is applicable, but it is not enough. Mm -hmm. And um, you still must study um, and uh, use the resources that Roma and Robin are sharing with you. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Catherine. That's very true. I agree. Uh, what is the average percentage of people who pass the exams? Uh, and within the exams, what is the passing grade? The passing grade is 80%. And I believe the average pass rate is something like 40%. So they are quite difficult exams for sure. But doable. But doable, yes. When you, when you prepare, they are doable. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Yes, don't let that scare you off. And then uh, they, a follow-up question to the to the to your results. You receive a letter with a pass-fail. Is it snail mail letter? I received an electronic letter, I think. Oh, I you did. Okay. Back when I did it, it was still snail mail. Yeah. Yeah. But now it's an email. Okay, that's good. I actually can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was an email. And then I got my certificate, you know, the really on that really nice paper yeah. uh, by, mail, by snail mail. Yeah. And do it does take quite a while. So you will have to wait, usually until at least March. Yeah. yeah. It's months. It's months. Yeah. So don't be checking that mailbox too keenly. For editing essentials, multiple choice format, how might the material of this Zoom be applied? Um, well, yeah, this 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 webinar is 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 specifically targeted for people who are preparing to take the certification exams. But I think that all the resources that we're sharing are certainly applicable to that and the amount of preparation that you want to do. I would say is also applicable to to that as well. But it but it tests it doesn't break it down by the four levels. It's all just in one exam. So you do have to kind of have a broader understanding of the basics of each type of editing. Thank you. This person says I work mostly with the APA style, but that's it, but it seems that this certification is mostly based on Chicago style. 
I know that's sorry. That's not true. We've, maybe we've given you the a false impression. Um, I think we. I mean, uh, speaking for myself, I mentioned Chicago because it is the one I work with mostly. However, I do work with publishers who um, who use APA. Um, it's just that the Chicago Manual style is really comprehensive, and so there are a lot of great sections in it about usage and grammar and punctuation and and uh, oh, help me Burma it's just yeah yeah and sort of the background processes and things we really wanted to to highlight that is if you if you need to learn more about public publishing processes in general it's it's excellent and the tests themselves because editors Canada understands that editors work in with different style guides they won't be testing you on you know according to APA, what does this say? Or according to CMOS, what does this say? It's not that kind of, it's more about your understanding of how to use a style guide in general, is what I would say. Good. <clears throat> Why is there such a long delay in learning the outcome of your exam? Presumably it's a matter of marking the exams, but four months seems excessive. My understanding, that might be a question better suited for the certification committee, but my understanding is that it goes through two markers and there's also an auditing process to make sure that everything's been done correctly because it is pretty high stakes. And that's my understanding. That's my understanding as well. And if those two don't agree, they send it to a third, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you can ask and ask that question. You're allowed to ask questions to the committee if you if you register and um, and even if you don't, maybe. And yeah, uh, I would send them. You know, if 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 that's a concern for you, they would be much better able to answer that question. Yeah. If we do not pass an exam and want to try again, when will the next exam in that same area be offered? Two years from now. So they go every two years. Uh, if one is considering devoting an editorial career to one particular area of editing, say web content, is there a compelling reason to take the exam when it requires so much broader experience? Well, as I said, um, I think most editors work tend to work in specialize in one or two genres. Um, but it's, I feel it's worth it because, um, well, for me personally, it was because it gave me more confidence, uh, but it, I think it really also um, made a huge difference in terms of uh, the rates I can, I feel comfortable charging. Um, it makes a big difference in potential clients being interested in hiring me. I, I, I think for those reasons alone, it's worth doing. So even, even if your work is strictly within, within, with web content, uh, presumably you could uh, seek more clients and who'll be and they'll be more interested in because interested in you because you set yourself apart from all the other editors who work with online content but are not certified. Great. Thank you. I agree. And uh, Amanda adds, uh, I've marked several exams and Roma is correct on the marking process. So thank oh, you for thank you, that. Amanda. Uh, somebody asked, why are the two exams done on the same day? It seems like a heavy burden to spend six straight hours on two separate exams. Yeah, that's also a question uh, better suited for the certification committee. I don't have an answer for that. Thank you. And um, oh, another person asked, I'm so curious about the low pass rate. Do some people not prepare? That's a great question. I guess, I guess so. Yeah. Or maybe uh, take the, take the exam without being ready for it. And that's why we have that checklist. That's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah we, um, the information that we were given is that um, the people who fail the exam uh in the, I mean, everybody indicates uh, if they take the survey after the exam, they'll indicate how much time they put into preparing. And um, there seems to be a correlation between 
uh, how much time people put in and whether they passed, but also uh, people who fail also tended to go beyond the scope mm -hmm. of the of what they were asked to do. So, That's a huge, huge yeah, issue. So if, Don't go so beyond if they were the writing, scope. If they were writing the proofreading exam and they did some copy editing, they're going to lose marks. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Um, we are just getting up to the top of the hour. Catherine, is it okay for us to just move on to make sure we have enough time to cover the rest of Yes, there's only one have... more question. Okay, let's do one Let's more. just do this. And then if, if any more come up, then I'll hold them until the next one. Great. Uh, to follow up on the style guide question, you say the questions are more broadly about how you would apply style guide in the scenarios, but applying the rules of CP versus CMOS, for example, would result in very different edits. How does the exam account for this? Oh, that's a good question. Um, trying to think. You know, it might say, indicate in your style guide, which, which, um, or your style sheet, sorry, which guide you've been using. So they make it a little bit more generic, I would say, mm -hmm. so that you have the space to use, you know, because again, it's about the consistency, right? That's really, really key for copy editing in particular. Yeah. So if I might say, I, we don't want to give you the impression that you need to um, know all the differences between, you know, citing notes using APA versus MLA versus Chicago, et cetera, that they're, that's not what the exam will be about. Yeah. The exam is about your, um, is testing or testing your ability to understand how to use a style guide. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Please go ahead. Great. Okay. Robin's going to take a look now at the copy editing exam in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the handout you received, uh, you'll see that Roma and, I, Roma and I made separate lists highlighting resources we found super helpful, but both lists include material that will be helpful to you when you're preparing for the copy editing exam. So uh, my slide of the copy editing resources, um, I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Uh, we've already mentioned copy editing meeting professional editorial standards, which is Editors Canada's publication that with the exercises. The other Editors Canada publications I've highlighted are editing Canadian English and its companion editing niches. That's a great resource with in-depth information written by experts on specific topics such as fact checking and editing online and visual materials. Um, most publishers I work with have made elements of Indigenous style a part of their own style guide. It's an excellent resource for learning ways an editor can help to ensure that Indigenous peoples are represented fairly, accurately, and rep respectfully. I also mention Amy Einstone's The Copy Editor's Handbook because there are sections on what copy editors do and on querying and style sheets, but I find the entire book indispensable. Apparently the 18th edition of CMOS is due out this fall, which is exciting, but I've included the 15th edition on this list because it was very helpful for me when I was preparing for the exams. I've always worked as a freelancer and at the time I wrote my first exam, I hadn't yet had any opportunity to work in-house. So the production and design processes uh, as explained in the appendices of the 15th edition of Chicago were my best resource for understanding the fundamentals of the publishing process. So I know that's not really about copy editing, but I wanted to mention that. Um, Substance and Style is a workbook of exercises that you copy edit on paper. It's out of print, but it's available secondhand through online sites like Abe Books. Carol Sowler is the former editor of the Chicago Style Q&A. I've included her book, The Subversive Copy Editor, not only because she gives great advice, but also because I think it's a fun read. Um, regarding conscious language resources, there are so many excellent ones online. I'm just going to mention a few of them here. Uh, Crystal Shelley's website, Rabbit with a Red Pen. Some of you may be familiar with her name. Crystal did a <laughs> Crystal, Crystal, Crystal did a webinar for Editors Canada on addressing and assessing problematic content. Um, 
uh, you'll, there's also one called GLAD's uh, Media Reference Guide, and that advocates for fair, accurate, and inclusive LGBTQ representation in media. There's the Diversity Style Guide um, that was originally based out of the Journalism Department at San, Fran San Francisco State University. Um, Writing with Color is a huge collective collection of advice blogs written by people of color and of diverse cultural and religious backgrounds that explore stereotypes and tropes in writing. I found that one, find that one very useful. The National Center on Disability and Journalism comes out of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. And the Language Project. That's an endeavor of the Marshall Project, which is named for former Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And that site focuses on writing accurately, fairly, and without bias about the criminal justice system. There's also a lot of available material about plain language principles. The one I've included here is the Canadian government's online style guide. It's an excellent resource with sections on writing principles for government documents and online content, as well as lessons in grammar. Um, as Roma has talked about, Editors Canada has updated its professional editorial standards this spring. There are some substantial differences from the 2016 standards, so do familiarize yourself with the new ones. As Roma mentioned, Part A in particular has been reorganized and expanded. Um, but with, regard, with regards to Part D, which pertains to copy editing, Really, there's nothing unusual or daunting about the 2024 version. They merely break down the things we already do in our work as professionals. The foundation is the same as the 2016 standards, which is to say the 24, 2024 standards still ensure correctness, consistency, accuracy, and completeness. Let's take a look at some of the changes. First, before I read this one. First, I just wanted to mention, as Roma did briefly, um, the section in uh, the 2016 copy editing standards uh, titled communication that has been moved from copy editing and it's now its own section in part A. And that makes sense, I think, because clear and diplomatic communication using established and accepted processes is a fundamental skill for all editors. So. Um, let's talk about this new standard, and it's related to accuracy. D3.4 states, identify and query any spelling or grammar errors within quotations to ascertain whether they were errors in the original text. Copy editors who work on academic materials or on newspaper and magazine articles will probably already be familiar with this approach to copy editing. The next change is a new standard related to completeness. D4.3 states, rec re recognize elements that require copyright acknowledgement and permission to reproduce. For example, quotations, multimedia, visual elements. Check that permissions have been obtained. If necessary, bring the matter to the appropriate person. The difference between this one and the 2016 standard included the additional sentence if necessary, prepare acknowledgements and obtain permissions. As we can see, that sentence has now been dropped. You are expected to flag a material that may need permission, but you're not expected to try to obtain that for yourself, for the author. Um, the last change I want to draw your attention to relates to correctness. D1.5 states, where appropriate, point out words and phrasing that can be considered harmful, disrespectful, or difficult to understand, keeping in mind conscious language and plain language principles. This is a new standard, and it reflects editors' evolving understanding of what correctness means. Let's look at some passages showing some possible issues that D1.5 refers to, and how you might approach copy, edi copy editing these passages in the exam. The first example could be a paragraph in a nonfiction book. Keith Haring was a social justice activist who depicted themes of anti-racism, anti-consumerism, and HIV AIDS stigma in his artwork. 
He believed in the power of public art to transform perceptions, and he created many of his drawings on the streets and subways of New York City so that the underprivileged and marginalized could easily access his art. Oh, by the way, I've just written these paragraphs, these examples myself for this webinar. Um, so now let's look at how a copy editor might approach this passage on the exam. So in this, ish in this example, the issue is terminology that is vague and biased. Instead, it would be clearer and more accurate to use specific and relevant terminology that describes the factors causing unequal access to Herring's art. All right, let's go on to some other uh, examples. Um, these, this one looks at some passages one might edit in fiction manuscripts. When she walked into the living room, she discovered a small stain on her expensive oriental carpet. It was evident that someone had scrubbed at it. She could see dried baking soda in the fibers. God damn it. Charlie had had a party, though I expressly said no. Okay, and let's look at another one. My dad never has time to hang out or even to eat dinner with us. All he does is work. He's killing himself to send as much money as possible home to my grandparents in Puerto Rico. So here are the issues I've identified and how I flagged them. The term oriental in the first paragraph is now considered outdated and offensive. And I have uh, flagged the, that word and let the author know. In the second paragraph, the phrase killing himself could cause unintentional harm to the readers. As I've noted to the author in my comment, it's an example of a violent metaphor that we use so casually we don't even notice what we're saying or realize the impact it could have on the people who hear it or read it. And the last example we'll look at could come from a newspaper or magazine article. The world is obsessed with Taylor Swift. The pop icons fans, known as Swifties, spend tens of thousands of dollars traveling to other continents in order to attend one of her concert, concerts. So here I have flagged the word obsessed. It's being used in a way that associates a preoccupation with a celebrity with excessive behavior. One could infer that the writer is judging Swifties negatively, but even if one thinks that it's a neutral or a positive statement, the label inadvertently perpetuates the stigma experienced by people with a mental health diagnosis. So these particular examples show the way language can stigmatize, denigrate, or exclude others, which is what conscious language editing is about. But language can also reshape the way we see each other and ourselves. And editors have both the opportunity and responsibility to help authors choose language that is instead inclusive and empowering. Does anyone have any questions about the copy editing exam specifically? There are currently no questions in the Q&A. Why don't we go ahead and then um, people, if you have questions, about the copy editing exam, don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A and we can uh, answer them when we stop next. Great, thanks Robin. <clears throat> I'll be looking now at the stylistic editing exam. So some resources to highlight the basics. Again, we have meeting professional tutorial standards, stylistic editing, particularly the overview that's in there. It's very, very helpful to define what stylistic editing is because it's stylistic editing is one of those things that can be a little bit hard to define sometimes. Chicago Manual of Style, particularly the section on syntax is very helpful. Robin had mentioned the copy editor's handbook and the final chapter of that handbook is called Beyond Grammar and it's excellent in talking about stylistic issues. So even if you don't have that book, go to the library and read that final chapter. Conscious language, uh, there is a great section in Chicago on bias-free language. Editing Canadian English has a section on inclusivity. CP style has a section on sensitive subjects. And then this is exciting news. Some of you might know that Karen Yin, who runs the Conscious Style Guide website has actually now published a book. So this is a really, really excellent resource for conscious language issues. 
And then specific topics in stylistic editing, um, Canadianization uh, in editing Canadian English, very helpful. Robin had mentioned elements of Indigenous style, in particular for stylistic editing. The section on terminology and the section on specific editorial issues can be very helpful. And then plain language, which absolutely falls under the purview of uh, stylistic editing. Uh, the resource I wanted to highlight is plain language, clear and simple. It's a bit of an older resource, but it's free and it's excellent. So please do check that out. Okay, taking a look at the new standards for stylistic editing. As with copy editing, the basics remain the same. The standards state that stylistic editing is editing to clarify meaning, ensure coherence and flow at the paragraph and sentence level, and refine the language. So that hasn't changed from 2016. However, some of the standards have been reworked, but the essence remains the same. But I did wanna highlight three bigger changes um, for you today that are three areas with new standards. So there is now a whole section on conscious language. Before the conscious language and the plain language were kind of, they were together in a section on, on language, but now they've been separated out and expanded a little bit as well. So C4 now is on conscious language. So 4.1, where appropriate point out words and phrasing that can be considered harmful, either intentionally or unintentionally, and suggest alternatives. 4.2, understand the author's intentions when editing language so that it does not inadvertently offend intended readers. Consider whether the language might be harmful to unintended audiences that it will likely reach. So here we're really talking about audience and context. So understanding who your intended readers are and what kind of language might offend them and then but who you know the wider wider readership as well the next is this new section called stylistic editing of narratives i find this one quite interesting 5.1 says help make the text more engaging and entertaining and ensure there are no boring passages 5.2 Check that the text achieves the intended effect on the audience. For example, try to ensure that the humor is funny, the erotica is arousing, the frightening passages are spine chilling. Be aware of the cultural differences that can make it difficult to target this kind of editing for specific audiences. So again, we're talking about audience context, who the intended reader is here. Very important. 5.3. Check that the mood of the writing matches the mood of the content. For example, a funeral scene shouldn't usually be written flippantly. And finally, 5.4, check that the mechanics of the writing match the content. For example, a calm description of recumbent sheep in a field can be written in long sentences and paragraphs, but an exciting fight scene should move quickly by using short sentences and paragraphs and common words words. So when I read this section, I really think that a lot of this applies very much to fiction editing, uh, maybe more creative endeavors. But I do think that, um, you know, especially the parts about making text more engaging, checking that the mood and that the mechanics of the writing uh, match the text can apply to any type of document that you're working on. And finally, there is, again, this separated out section now, stylistic editing in plain language. 6.1, when applying plain language principles in stylistic editing, do the following. A, as much as possible, use the intended reader's vocabulary. B, prefer concrete terms to abstract terms. For example, frog instead of amphibian. C, use only the same words for the same meaning and different words for different meanings. 
and D, use language that is culturally relevant for the readers. So these are basic principles of plain language, but specifically how they might apply in a stylistic editing context. So I wanted to give you an example of how we can apply some of these standards or how they might be tested on an exam. So this is the scenario. Okay, and again, as of Robin, I made this all up. Okay, so this is a pretend question. Scenario, the following is an excerpt from a volunteer orientation guide for a cat shelter. The purpose of the guide is to teach new volunteers what they will be responsible for. Volunteers vary widely in age, but are most commonly either teenagers or older adults who have retired. The excerpt is as follows. Volunteers who work in the shelters are known as cat buddies. They take on two main roles, cat buddy and kennel buddy. Cat buddies work directly with the feline residents, taking the kiddos out of their cages and into a playroom where they interact with the cats by offering socialization, mental stimulation, behavioral intervention, and nose boops. In most cases, particularly with the smalls, kitties need to be played with individually, and so this is a paw-on-paw -paw task. In other cases, residents need to socialize with other cats and may be taken out in pairs or clouders. And your question is, identify two broad stylistic issues with this excerpt in relation to the document's audience and purpose. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, the standards that are relevant here are 3.1, ensure that the voice, style, point of view, tone, and register are presented consistently and in keeping with the content and the author's goals and intentions. 6.1, when applying plain language principles and stylistic editing, do the following. B, prefer concrete terms to abstract terms. C, use only the same words for the same meaning and different words for different meanings. So these are the two that might that are being tested in this question. So if you look at here, I've highlighted the issues. So in the yellow, we have all the different words that are applying to the same thing. Feline residents, kittos, cats, smalls, kitties. So we have five different words here apply, um, referring to the same thing, which is the cat or the cats that live in the shelter. And then in the green, you'll see a change here in the register. Socialization, mental stimulation, behavioral intervention, and nose boops. So that's another issue. Then I've highlighted in blue, individually versus paw on paw task. And then finally in the purple, the word clouders. So these are all the potential issues that are going on here. And then I've drafted three potential answers to this question. Multiple words referring to the same thing, cat, are used. This interferes with the goal of the document by being distracting and imprecise. This also goes against plain language principles of using the same word to refer to the same thing. Another an possible answer, some of the words are uncommon or slang, such as kittos and smalls. The target audience has a wide range of backgrounds, so they may not all be familiar with the different terminology used. And finally, the different vocabulary used changes the register of the text. For example, using both the technical term behavioral intervention and the slang term nose boops in the same sentence can be distracting and confusing. So remember that the question was to identify two broad stylistic issues with this excerpt in relation to the document's audience and purpose. So it's especially important to remember the context here, the document's audience and purpose. So in certain contexts, you know, maybe a socials post or a marketing email, we can use play, playful language like kiddos and smalls. But here we're dealing with a training document. We want people to get the information clearly. We don't want them to be confused. What is a kiddo? What is a small? Um, what is a clouder for that matter? That was another issue you could have raised. A clouder is a group of cats, but we don't. It's not a common, super common word. 
So we don't want to distract the audience. We don't want to confuse them because this is really a training document. We want to make sure they're getting the information that they need. And we want to make sure that the meaning of each term is clear. Note also in these possible answers what I have not done, which is I have not suggested changes. The question was very clear in saying identify two broad issues. So remember to stick to what the question has asked you to do. Any questions about the stylist exam or the copy editing exam, or we have um, a bit of time now, we can go back to some of the earlier questions as well. Great, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions. <clears throat> With concerns of conscious language, would you offer examples that would be more acceptable or would you just offer up the issue involved and leave it to the author to address? I find it helpful to always offer examples to authors in case they're unfamiliar, but is that outlined in the standard? It's a really good question. Um, we, we definitely want to flag the issue. Um, Roma, what do you think? Well, I think that the way the standard is written for copy editing is the flagging the issue is the most important thing. I think that it would be acceptable to also offer alternatives, suggested alternatives, but not to make those changes. I think that's where the difference really is to not just go through and make those changes, but uh, flag it for the author, explain it to the author, because again, with conscious language in particular, some of these issues are new to folks and we need to understand that. And so explain it and then offer. I think in one of your examples, Robin, you had said maybe antique might be more appropriate than mm -hmm. the word that, that had been used. That's That's my understanding of it. Great. For the question that Roma just presented on cats, would that be an example of something you would see in part A? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, no, because they're all they're all going to be multiple choice questions in part A, right? That might be an example of one paragraph within yes the the, the passage. Yes, yes, yeah. So part A is going to be all in the fundamentals and then also they're all multiple choice questions. They used, back when I wrote them, they were still fill in the blanks or like short answer, but I believe they changed that a couple of years ago. So yeah, thanks for that question. It would be more in the, the longer scenario passage. Thank you. Do you need to be familiar with editing fiction as well as nonfiction texts? With the principles, I think, mm -hmm. which are really the same. I, I, I personally think that the principles are the same, whether you're editing a fiction or nonfiction. Yeah, again, it's the the basic foundational issues are going to be the same. I don't edit fiction. I've edited one fiction book in my whole life. Um, and I was able to pass pass the exams. Um, any of the fiction specific questions, I think, can be filled in with doing some of that background reading. Because, yeah, whether you're editing fiction or nonfiction, you're still going to want to think of, well, actually, I should say it depends on the exam you're writing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Would the C5 standard be examined in both Part A and Part B? It seems a little subjective. The C5, which one is, um, that's for stylistic. Sorry, what's the question again? Would it be tested sure. would in? This, would the C5 standard be examined in both part A and part B? It seems a little subjective. It is subjective. I agree with you. I... It, we, we we don't know what um yeah what the nature of the passage or the scenario for that matter would be on the exam but but let's just i mean for example what in the uh, mpes one of the exercises is 
a passage from a fiction book. But the point of it is to recognize um, recognize issues that really could pertain to nonfiction too. So yes, there is making the text more engaging, but on, honestly, actually, you could probably even apply that standard to nonfiction text. text. Yeah. You know, if, if it was particularly unengaging, you might want to flag it, but um, uh, sorry, I've sort of lost track now of the question again. Would the C5 standard be examined in both part A and part oh. B? Well, I, I mean, poss it could be, I mean, but yeah. if it was, in, if it was in part A, it would be like a, a multiple choice question or a fill in the blank. So, I, I mean, I'm making this up, but maybe it'll be one cent. I'm no, you know, I don't even know if I can I'm trying to think <laughs> an example. It might, it might just, it might just be, you know, a question might be something like the text that it might give you a little, a little blurb like a little excerpt of the text and then ask you to identify what what the issues are the four four different issues and you have to identify oh um you know the the mechanics of the writing don't match the the right or is it possible they might ask um uh, if you were asked to make the text more engaging mm. is that is that an example of copy editing or stylistic editing yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then I just note that we have only three minutes left mm -hmm. um, to the end. So this question is a little bit uh, bigger. Um, and if I may, I, I'll add something to it. Uh, and then I'll pass it over to Roba, Roma and Robin. It's for stylistic editing, could you recommend which resources you would purchase versus, versus borrow from the library? And if mm -hmm. I may suggest, um, I mean, certainly look for as many resources as as you like in the library, if you can find the resources, then you can borrow them from the library, but um, maybe not all things will be available in the library. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Um, sort of, so the, I think the question is kind of which, which of them we sort of want to invest in and have on hand at all times. And I think part of that is, you know, what work, that you do, you know, will you be using it in the future in your work or not? If not, and you're just using it to prepare for the exams, then I would definitely just, you know, go to go to the library to get it. Um, but if it's something that you're going to be using regularly in your work, then I think that that's a really good business expense and a good investment to make. Something like Editing Canadian English, I highly recommend buying that book just because it has such good information across all types of editing. It's very relevant to everything and it's Canadian specific, I think, which really we lack a lot of Canadian specific resources. So I would absolutely recommend buying that one. Um, and then presumably you would, you know, hopefully have access to a style guide, at least a style manual. I mean, um, yeah, that would be kind of my, my professional suggestion and maybe if 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 the budget is tight then then holding off on buying some of the ones that you don't think you'll use on a regular basis uh, indigenous elements of indigenous style i would say is an absolute must have in your personal library as well great thank you and um this webinar is being recorded and will be sent to everyone afterwards and will also be available um through editors canada Great, thank you, Robin and Roma, for such an informative webinar. It's uh, great examples and resources. Uh, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time. Thanks so much.